Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our final meeting of the Harvard Archaeology Seminar for the fall 2020 uh, semester. Uh, we'll next convene in 2021, which can only be a better year, I have to say. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Eduardo Neves, but I'm going to turn this over to my co-host, uh, Amy Arsenal for some uh, logistical announcements first. Sure, thanks Jason. Uh, hi everybody, uh, thanks Eduardo for being here today. Um, those of you who don't know me, I am Amy Arsenal, the assistant to the archeology span program. I'm the co-coordinator of this seminar series. So as Jason said, this is our final one for the fall semester. Um, and I just wanted to mention that any Harvard graduate students that would like to be a part of the breakout room, that's from 1 to 1.30, please just send me a message in the chat and I will add you. And that's it. Thank you, everybody. So it is a great pleasure to welcome back to Harvard our old friend, Dr. Eduardo Neves. Um, we are hosting him today um, in uh, collaboration with the David Rockefeller Center uh, for Latin American Studies, and we're very grateful for that co-hosting. Um, Eduardo is professor of Bra Brazilian archeology span at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. He got his bachelor's degree in history at the University of Sao Paulo and his MA and PhD in anthropology at Indiana University. Uh, since the 1990s, he's worked at different areas of the Brazilian Amazon, aiming to align archaeology with indigenous and environmental history. From 1995 to 2010, Eduardo directed the Central Amazon Project. Now, currently, he is researching southwestern Amazonia at the current border of Bolivia and Brazil, where he has been studying Middle Holocene occupations on fluvial shell mounds, as well as the archaeology of late pre-colonial mound building societies. In the course of this research, he's also involved a lot of Harvard affiliates. He's the co-director of, uh, uh, he has been co-director of, of Harvard Field School in Brazil. And I, as I look at the faces I see here, I can see uh, many alumni of, of that project. Um, so Eduardo is the past president of the Brazilian Archaeological Society. He's a former member of the Board of Directors of the Society for American Archaeology, and he's been a visiting professor in several universities in the Americas and Europe. Um, and here, I will say that I remember very fondly his time in Harvard Anthropology in 2016 and 2017. So it is a pleasure to welcome Eduardo back. He'll be speaking um, and maybe even answering the question of how old is the Anthropocene in southwestern Amazonia? Welcome back. Eduardo. Well, thank you very much, Jason, and good afternoon to everyone. I, I, you know, I, I just like look briefly at the images. So I saw some, I saw some old friends that I met while there. It's a pleasure to be back, even if it's even if remotely. And it's it's. Uh, I mean, that's a crazy day. I was just talking to Jason before, you know, we got we got started here. I imagine everybody's you know you know expecting the results about the election. I remember I was there at Harvard four years ago when the other presidential election happened and I had to teach the, 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 the day after the election. And the reason why I'm talking about the election today because I really think, you know, when we talk about archeology span in the Amazon, I think there's a very strong connection uh, between, you know, current politics and, and, and what, what the archeological span record tells us. I mean, we know that's valid for archeology span all over the world, it's not only in the Amazon. But I really think that you know when we talk when we look back at, at the pre, you know at the ancient past and the way indigenous people have lived and settled in the Amazon, there's a very strong connection between the, the uh, management practices of indigenous people in the past and the kind of landscapes that we see today in the Amazon, which are being like, unfortunately treaded and destroyed uh, you know over the last forty years, but more you know intensively in the last years. So again, again, political discussions are either the matter about the present, our, our lives, but in, in the case of the Amazon and of, of the indigenous people who live in the Amazon, it's a very important concern as well. The title that I gave to this talk, How Old is the Anthropocene, comes in the in Southwestern Amazon, comes from the fact that I am teaching a class right now, a graduate seminar on the Anthropocene, and we've been discussing, I'm doing that with a group of people here at the University of Sao Paulo, which includes anthropologists, but also philosophers. And I'm the one playing like, you know, the token scientists coming from archeology. span And we've been, one of the topics that being like, we've been bouncing back 
and fourth is like how old is uh, how old is the Anthropocene? How how can we define stratigraphically the onset of the Anthropocene? And you know, so what I want to do in this talk here is like I'm just presenting this question very briefly now, and then I'll bring some examples of my own work, which I'm currently doing in southwestern Amazon. It's a joint project that includes people from different places here in Brazil, Bolivia as well as the UK and the US. We have like, you know, it's a large group of people. It's a binational project, Brazil and UK. And one of the things that we're trying to understand in this project is how people, how indigenous people have been changing and creating landscapes over the millennia in this particular area. So what, what I want to do here today is just to start to bring some examples of the ongoing research. We have some data, which is already there. Some things were just still like trying to work and make sense out of these results. And in the end, I'd like to go back to this question and try to come up with some kind of answer. I don't know if I have a good answer, but at least I can try to move forward this question of how old is the Anthropocene in Southwestern Amazon. And that saying that I'll, I'll, I'll jump to the slides. Let me just see if I can do this right. And Is it there? Let me see. Some people who, you know, and I know some people who are there may have taken, you know, the, the classes that I've, that I've given while I was there at Harvard. So you may see some slides which are, you know, familiar from that time as well. That means, you know, I have new, I have new stuff to show as well, but, you know, I'm building up on this old information. So, I mean, I, I always like, when I'm talking about Amazonian archaeology, I love to use this image here, which is not, some of you may have, may have seen that already. It was taken not here in Brazil, but in Ecuador, in Ecuador and Amazon. And if you look at it, you can see there's a scale bar on the bottom left, you know, it shows us like uh, 875 meters. And that's a typical, what I call frontier colonization era in contemporary Amazon. We see some standing forests in it, but we also see cattle ranches, small, you know, small farms. We, see, we, still, we see some modern roads at the bottom left as well. And this area here, there's a lot of mining interest going on. And because of that, the Equatorial Ministry of Culture has sponsored a LIDAR survey of this area. And the, and the images are really astonishing and, and, and very interesting. That's the same place after a LIDAR survey, the same area. And if you look at it, you're going to see there's lots of like geometric structures, squares of different size. They're forming like, you know, look like in some, in some cases, it looks like they're forming compounds with central pa patios surrounded by the, 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 by, by the linear structures. This whole place is saturated with these geometric features. And these geometric features are archaeological sites. These are artificial earth structures, which were built by people who live in this area in the Opano Valley in Ecuador. Uh, you know, this kind of structures, they begin to form, they began to form around 20, 2,700 years ago. So this whole place here that looks like a pristine forest is actually a landscape full of evidence of previous human occupation. I mean, this is a kind of a radical example, but I think it really shows us the potential that we have about working in the Amazon. And, and, and the, one of the central questions of, of Amazonian archeology span is like, in, in the last 30 years, it has been to show that the Amazon has been densely settled and occupied in the past, and that indigenous people, in a way, have created the Amazon that we know today. So when we talk about protecting the Amazon, we're not only talking about protecting the natural heritage, which is very important, but also protecting uh, landscapes that result from you know, indigenous action and agency in the past. So, I mean, there's an emerging, I think there's not even an emerging consensus anymore. Now, we, we archaeologists, we hard, you know, archaeologists hardly agree on an issue. You know, if you have two archaeologists together, they're going to have three opinions about a topic, but I think that, you know, almost by, you know, an act of miracle, archaeologists working in the Amazon, I would say like almost everyone who works in the Amazon, we're not so many, but it's like, you know, it's a, it's a growing field, would agree that Amazonian biomes were deeply transformed by indigenous peoples, you know, indigenous societies in the past. And this pattern, I mean, it's very, it's, it's quite clear, we begin to see good evidence of, you know, landscape creation and or transformation going back to, you know, 2,500 years ago, but I really think, I mean, we're beginning to build up evidence that show that this, these patterns of, you know, transformation and create, creation of landscapes may go back to the Middle Holocene. And again, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't want to bring a spoiler to the end of my talk, but I mean, that's really, you know, archaeologists listen to me, will really think about maybe this could be evidence 
that could tell us that we have something there in terms of creation of you no know, a stratigraphic record of human action that could pull back push back the beginning of the you know the Anthropocene um, to I'm not introducing the Anthropocene here right now I, I think everybody is aware of it but I can talk about more of this topic at the end of the or, or, or at the end of the presentation but I, you know just making a, a brief parenthesis here archaeologists such as Bruce Smith and Melinda Zeder for instance they've been they've been trying you know, trying to present the idea that the Anthropocene is very old it goes back to the beginning of the Holocene maybe around ten thousand years ago. Okay, so I mean, that's an open question for the Amazon because we really have good evidence. And I'm talking about the Amazon, but I think every archaeologist, you know, seeing this presentation here will think about her or his own research area. And we have good evidence that people have been, you know, transforming, creating landscapes and transforming nature, you know, way before, you know, uh, uh, you know to, throughout the Holocene. Okay. <clears throat> the Upper Madeira, that's the area I'm going to be talking about here, what I've been working for the last 10 years. And why is this area so interesting? And why have, you be, have, have we been working there? Is that because in the Upper Madeira, for reasons which are not very clear to us yet, we have a good record that spans the whole Holocene throughout the Amazon. So if you're trying to understand when people begin to change in the patterns of landscape transformation, the, the Upper Madeira is a good place to do it because we have evidence there that brings that we know that people have been living there since the beginning of the Holocene and this record goes up until today. Uh, the Madeira River, it's the largest tributary of the Amazon. It's, it, 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 you know, it's, it has its headwaters at the Andes, uh, the Indian Cordillera. It heads towards the central Amazon. I'm going to be talking more about some, you know, the characteristics of the river in, in, in a few moments, but it's, it, it's, it had such a massive volume of water and sediments that, that there are times of the year that it brings more sediments into the Amazon than the Amazon in itself. It, it joins the, the Amazon in the central Amazon in, in, and the Madeira in itself, it's one of the largest rivers of the world. The Amazon basin, the, the, the discharge of the Amazon basin, in the Atlantic Ocean is around uh, one fifth of all uh, above ground fresh water that we have in the planet. So it's a lot of like, you know, fresh 18% being brought to, towards the Atlantic Ocean and the Madeira River is the, rivers, the largest tributary of the Amazon. Well, what we know about the archaeology of this area, I mean, these pictures come from Bolivia. I'll be talking about Brazil and Bolivia, neighboring countries here in South America. Since the work of a geographer, a geographer William Denevan, back in the 1960s, for instance, we know that people who lived there had really like, exerted a major influence in creating landscapes in this area. For instance, if you look at the, the picture in the left here, all these linear structures that we see there are raised fields, which were built by people in this area. This part of the Upper Madeira Basin in Bolivia is a transitional um, um, uh, biome between you know, flooded savannas, open areas, and you know, tall evergreen forests. Also in Bolivia, I'm you know, the idea here is to provide you, you know, with a notion of the archaeological cultural diversity there. Well, what we see there in this area as well are monumental mounts. People call them monumental mounts. For instance, this is a plan of a site called Loma Salvatierra, which was excavated by a group of German and Bolivian archaeologists. And if you look at it, it's, you know, there's no rocks there. So all raw material people were using to construct, to build these structures were soil and also wood, for, for instance, and, 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 and straw. But what we have today is the soil structure. So if you look at it, it's quite, you know, quite similar in a way to what we see in the Mississippi Valley there in the U.S. with Mississippian archaeology, you know, earth structures, you know, uh, uh, with, with wells, with, with uh, uh, ditches and artificial mounds. You can, you know, this is a mound that we're digging right now in Bolivia. You can look at it. Everything that you see in this picture, it's artificial. This, this hill where the top of the, of the, where the house was built, uh, it's actually much larger than we see in this picture here. Is an artificial structure built in this area. This dates back to the sixth and seventh century uh, CE. And you can, if you look at it, you can see that's just, a, you know, we just refreshed. This picture was taken last year, like around a year ago. And if you look at it, you can see like, you know, small strata related to mound building. We have thicker strata, which you think are occupation. We're just trying to understand the process of mound building in this area. But again, it's, it's very good evidence, you know, of, you know, what we're gonna, I'm gonna use the word here just for the sake of it, like of monumental, Earth and architecture in this part of southwestern Amazon, full of pot shirts and the profiles as well. In this area, we also, you know, it's very rare to find that in the Amazon, but we also find structures built with stones. 
This is a famous site called Las Piedras, which is, which is also in Bolivia, not far from the border with Bolivia and Brazil, where Inca pottery has been found. And there's, a, there's an old debate going on whether the Inca were, this is really further west, further east, I'm sorry, from the expansion of the Inca empire. But you know, some people suggest that this maybe was an out, you know, like a fur, further outpost of the Inca towards the Amazon. But we find this kind of evidence there as well. This area is also interesting, the south, you know, the upper Madeira in southwestern Amazon is because it's, a, it's, a, it's an accepted center of independent plant domestication. If you look at this map, it's, you know, it's a, already a few years old, but I think, you know, the basic information in this map still holds. It was published by Bruce Smith in 2006, and it presents us here some of the, you know, the accepted centers of independent plant domestication in the world. And South America is remarkable for that matter because you have three different centers there. If you look, if you can see it, like there's some classic centers in the Levant, you know, New Guinea, China, two centers, one in, you know, Mesoamerica, another one in the Eastern, Eastern US, where we have three different centers of plant domestication. And, in South America, maybe we can lump them together with two centers, one in the lowlands in the Amazon, the other one in the highlands in the Andes. But Southwestern Amazon, again, you see some of the important plants which were domesticated there, such as peanuts, manioc, and chili peppers. You can see, you know, if you look at South America in the map, I don't think I can use the pointer here, but if you look at the map, you see South America, can you see, can I, yeah, you can see this is, this is the area what I'm talking about as well. And if you zoom out a little bit of Southwestern Amazon, again, I'm not gonna be talking much about that. I'll go back to this point. I mean, the whole Amazon was a cradle of plant domestication. And it's becoming more and more clear as we do more archaeobotany in the Amazon, you know, micro remains, macro remains, isotopic analysis. We're trying to do this in this project as well. It's in genetic data as well. It really points to us. The names here are in Portuguese, but important plants such as manioc, such as peanuts, chili peppers, cacao, which was very important, still is in Mesoamerica, uh, um, tobacco, uh, the var variety of coca, sweet potatoes. You know, these are plants which were domesticated in the Amazon basin, pineapple. So the, the Amazon is an important credo. It's important, not only Southwestern Amazon, but the whole Amazon basin is an important center for plant domestication. And one remarkable thing, just be before moving forward, if you look at this roster of plants that I have in this map, a lot of them are trees, so tree crops are very important, and others are tubers. Well, although we have good evidence, and if you look at this map, it's in Portuguese, I'm sorry about that. We see all the, the plant names are in white, but we have two plant names writing, written here in, in, in red. One is milho, which means corn or maize in Portuguese, and the other one is rice. We have evidence of maize cultivation going back to 6,000 years in this era. Of course, maize is a plant coming from Mesoamerica, so it gets there very early but also evidence of domestication of rice. So we have some grain, cereals were important as well, but most of those plants domesticated and cultivated in the Amazon were tree crops or root crops. And some of them actually are not even domesticated. For instance, the acai palm, which is very, it's a very important palm. It's a cash crop today, but it's a non-domesticate cultivated by people living there. That's why we've been trying, you know, I'm just making a comment here, a side comment. Archaeologists working in this topic in the Amazon, we're trying to really, you know, pr provide a different alternative to, to terms such as, we don't use Neolithic in the new world, but like things like formative, because again, it doesn't really, really fit the picture well. Okay, so, uh, so I'll, I'll move then now to, to the work we're doing in this area. Uh, so, uh, again, I mean, we, we have you know, genetic evidence, some evidence of plant domestication there, but we really, what we're trying to do now there in this area is to understand how this process of landscape, plant domestication and landscape domestication unfolded over the years. And I'm gonna be talking about two sites here, which I've been working on for, for, for the last year. Even, even before I went to Harvard four years ago, I was already working there and some people, some of you may, may have seen some of those pictures. One of them is Teotonio, which is located at, at just next to the Madeira River. That, that's a picture of the Madeira River that, next to Teotonio Rapids. The Madeira, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about that in a few moments, but the, 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 there's a stretch of the Madeira, a 350 kilometer long stretch where we find several rapids. And these rapids, they're very important because you know they're like endemic fish species. When fishes spawn up river, it's easier to catch fishes there as well. So there's a tendency for people in the present, but also in the past to settle close to those rapids. And Teotonio, it's, it's, it's a case in point for that matter. We have a record there 
and who uh, 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 were supposed to, to have been in the field last June, but because of the pandemic, we could do it. But we have very thick, I mean, all this deposit that we see, everything that you see in this cut here is anthropic. It's anthropic soils, dark soils mixed up with pottery. So these are, are you know, artificial stratigraphies. People, are not, they're, they're not mound builders. They're not building mounds there, but just like a natural, a cultural process of soil formation. We have, you know, mix up of anthropic soils, you know, terras pretas in Portuguese and ceramic sherds as well. Again, it, it, it provides us a good record that goes back at, at, to the early Holocene, toward 9,000 years ago. We've been like really working on different parts on the site, collecting samples for soil analysis, plant analysis, faunal analysis as well. That's, uh, this is Thiago Cutter, a grad student, a graduate, a PhD student of mine. And the work in Teutonio has allowed us to find out, I'm gonna, I won't have the time to discuss this in detail here, but we'll be able to find, for instance, expose, you know, the 5,500 50, year old stratum of anthropic soils. I mean, these are soils which were made by people who live in there. These are very fertile soils. Those dark soils are called, you know, again, terras pretas in Portuguese. People look at them today for farming. They're an important resource in the Amazon for traditional societies, but we know they're being created by indigenous people in the past. And at Teotoni, we have the oldest record of uh, ADE or anthropic soil formation going back to 5,500 years ago. And those soils, because of the of their you know their, their chemical properties, their very you know their, their pH is much more neutral than the typical acidic soils of the Amazon, the adjacent soils. So the conditions of preservation are you know good for Amazonian context for organic remains. So we have evidence there. That's just an ex it's again it's in Portuguese, but I'll translate the, the name. We have a good record there of, of plants management going back to the early Holocene, you know, almost 9,500 years ago, including plants such as guava, such as the Brazil nut, pequia, which is a, it's, it's a tree crop, aria, which is a root crop. And around 50, you know, uh, 55, 5,700 years ago, we begin to see the cultivation of squashes, of beans, manioc, and other tree crops as well. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a consistent, I mean, as far as it's consistent can be in, 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 a, in exploratory work, but it's a good record that tells us a, a history of plant management, cultivation, and domestication in some cases. Another example comes from Monte Castello, which is a, it's a shell mount. If you look at this picture, you're gonna see in the foreground, there's something that looks like an island, but this is, this, this is an artificial island. This, this, it's, Monte Castello is further south than Teotonio, that's a remote area today. It's, it's, it's close to an indigenous land and also like a, 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 national, a national park. And it's, that's a picture from, you know, from this. I just took it in the field uh, this year. That's the, it, everything that you see in this hill here is artificial. This part of the Amazon, this area of the Amazon, part of the year, it's a dry savanna, like in the Bolivian case, it's actually in the border between Brazil and Bolivia. But part of the year, it's the flood season. You only get there by boat. We were in the field when the pandemic struck here in Brazil, and we were there without any connections to the outside world. So when I got, when I got off the field in, in uh, March 15, and everything, like the whole world had changed. I was there for two, two weeks, no connection whatsoever. We got out, we're living in a boat nearby and I'm getting there by boat uh, every day to, to do the excavation. And then getting off the field, I realized we have like half ton of samples to send, airports were shut. Everybody was like really, it was a long story. I could give a talk only about like getting all of the field in the last March from Monte Castello. But that's an interesting site for many reasons. First, because I mean, when we first got there, this site was ex excavated before in 1983 by a kind of like a Brazilian archeologist. He was like an, a local equivalent of the Indiana Jones kind of, you know, archeologist. He'll go along to like the real Mesoamerican archeologist. He was the real Amazonian archeologist. He'll go along to the field. He'll be boasting about you know, the 40, you know, bouts of malaria that he had in the past. He was very proud about his, you know, being a tough guy and working alone. And this guy was working there back, back in 1983 and he never went back. So he got money from National Geographic and we were able to re relocate the site in 2013. When we got there, the information that we received that this place was abandoned, there was nobody living there, it was an empty place, but we found evidence of camps, people were camping there. And to make a long story short, the Tupari Indians who live not far from there, they return to this place every year in the, in the wet season to camp, to hunt, and they bring the young kids, the young men, to teach them how to hunt and to, to, 
to live in the forest. They're trying to reclaim this area because they used to live in this area before the national park was created. But Brazilian legislation, like in the US, I think, when a national park, you know, a conservation unit is created, it has to exclude people who live there. So these fellows were kicked out of this area back in you know, the late 1980s, but you know, they, they come back there every year. We begin to correspond with them. So if you look at this tree, you have you know, things written by the Tupari Indians in the tree. And I wrote a letter, it's written in Portuguese, but I can't translate, it's just like, you know, to the, to the settlers of the Palhau village. We start to correspond with them, you know, leaving messages on the trees. And eventually this year, we were able to bring them to work with us in the field. So we, we did, this, was, this picture was taken while the world was falling apart. And you can see there's a combination. We have, you know, the, the Tupari's were there. We have archeologists working there as well. And it was an, it was an amazing experience. And, you know, and, and we, you know, the idea is like to keep working together with them. We, I, I don't have any pictures, but we dig in a cemetery going back, daily back to like 4,200 years ago. And it was interesting just to be there with them to talk about the burials and how we were dealing with these kinds of materials. That's the profile of the site. It's a deeply stratified site. We have good dates. Now that really tells us that we be, it began to be occupied around 6,000 years ago. And we have the process of you know, the, the uh, accumulation of shells because it's a shell mount. Shells are interesting because you know, they, they provide almost like a neutral pH. So the conditions of preservation of organic remains are exceptional in this site. That's again a view of the excavation uh, the, the, uh, this, this year. And that's you know, the, the, just an idea of the, you know, the kinds of materials that will be covering there. When people think about the Amazon, they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't really think about good conditions of preservation of organics. But we have in this case, because of the shell mound and the shell matrix, we have a, exceptional conditions of you know, macro remains of plants and fauna and ceramics as well. The ceramics there are very interesting because we have dates going back to 4,200 years and even older ceramics going back to 5,200 years ago. That's two, uh, you know, uh, uh, so one of the oldest dates that we have for ceramics in the Americas. I mean, they're, they're, older, they're old ceramics, older ceramics in North Florida and other places in the Amazon as well, going back to almost 7,000 years ago. But 5200 is you know, pretty old for ceramics there as well. Again, we're doing the work with the macro remains, you know, we're recovering evidence. And the, the data that we have from the macro remains shows us the same pattern, like tree cultivation, as I mentioned before, and root crop cultivation as well. Although, as I mentioned as well, uh, also we have evidence of rice domestication uh, and cultivation in the site. We wrote, I wrote this art, you know, I co-wrote this article while I was there with you guys in the department. It was published in 2017. Uh, so, I mean, what, what does the data from Southwestern Amazon tells us? Just to sum up this part of the talk here. I think that th th this that I just mentioned briefly before, that we, this, this pattern of like tree crop and root crop cultivation it's very old in the Amazon. <clears throat> it goes back to the early Holocene and tree cultivation. I mean, this is a Brazil nut tree. Once a tree is planted, with one, such as a Brazil nut tree, you can live for you know, 500, 600 years. So these trees, I mean, one, once a stand, an orchard is planted, it really like becomes a visible thing in the landscape that has a very long, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, can, I can say like history of, of use and manipulation of the people. For instance, this, this Brazil nut tree, it's in the top of a site that we're also working on in the central Amazon. And if you look at these pictures, these are pictures, this was actually taken in the field as well, in the same area where I took this picture from this tree here. This was our breakfast. And people still have this diet today in the Amazon. Like you see, like, you know, different roots like yams, bananas were introduced. Uh, after the, the, the beginning of the colonization, but all, everything that you see in this picture, or most of the things are fruits or roots, which have been like being, you know, eaten by people in the Amazon for thousands of years. So again, this pattern seems to be quite resilient and very consistent over the millennia. Another example, you know, we see cacao here, in the front row mangoes were introduced, but we have Brazil nuts, we have uh, cashews in the, uh, um, to the right, and at the back of this picture, there's this purple thing in a bucket. That's the acai vine, the, the acai, the, the juice of the acai palm. So again, the, 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 the same idea. I like I like this picture because of the colors, but it really provides a good example of the you know this kind of mix economies that are very old, very consistent, and very robust across the Amazon. Okay, so what does it have to do? You know, so I'm, I'm you know I'm moving to the second part of the talk now. So what does it really tell us about the present? I mean, that's, that's a picture that's, I always, I, I love this article and I always use this image here. If you look at it, it's, a, uh, it's an article published in Science, 
seven years ago, it, it was an inventory of trees in the Amazon. And everything that you see, every point that you see in this map of the Amazon is a place where an, an inventory was taken by different people. So the authors of the article, they bring everything together under the same platform. And they have a few questions that they wanted to ask. The first of them, how many trees are there in the Amazon? How many tree species are there in the Amazon? And the results are really staggering. Like, you know, again, 390 billion trees in the Amazon. It's a lot of trees, we won't expect that in the Amazon. And grouped in around 16,000 species. Again, many tree species in the Amazon. But then the interesting thing comes in the, on the bottom of the slide here. All of this staggering amount of trees, individual trees and tree species, only 227 27 species. Therefore, just 1.5% account for almost half of the trees in the Amazon. So what's the point in here? There are many trees in the Amazon. There are many species in the Amazon of trees, but a very small amount of those species are really overrepresented in the record. That's why these people call them hyperdominant species. And if you look at this roster of the hyperdominant species, you're gonna find many of the trees that we also find preserved in the archeological record. And to me, that means that there's a, there's, a, there's a very interesting connection between people's practices over the millennia, indigenous people and traditional societies, and the constitution of the layout of Amazonian biomes that we see today. One of those species is the, is the rubber tree. If you look at this, I mean, that's, it's kind of like a wimpy picture I've, take, I've taken in the field last year, but that's the best picture that I have of rubber trees at the moment. That's a small rubber tree plantation. All these, like, you know, the, 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 trees that you, the small trees that you see in this picture are rubber trees. People are still planting. They're trying to plant <clears throat> this species uh, um, in different places in the Amazon today. But the rubber trees, I mean, they were very important for Brazilian and, and Amazonian economy at the turn from the 19th to the 20th century. I mean, the rubber boom generated a lot of wealth, lots of misery and, and, and problems for indigenous people. But you know, if, if you go to places like Manaus in Belém, cities in the Amazon, Iquitos, you see these like monumental opera houses and these you know, palaces. And these things were built with money from, from the rubber, you know, from, from, the, from the rubber boom. And again, we have to bear in mind that the rubber tree is one of the hyperdominant species that I mentioned before. So again, it's, it's a, just just bring this in mind because I would like to work with this idea in the rest of the presentation. If you look at this map here, again, you're going to see that one area in the Amazon where we see there's a there's a there's a very large number of domesticated or managed hyper hyperdominant species. One of these areas is southwestern Amazon (SWA) as we see in this map here. And we also know that this was a very important era during the rubber boom. There was a lot of rubber there. there. And that's why Brazil and, uh, you know, took part of Bolivia, which is today Acre state, in a way like, like the US deal with Texas, Brazil dealing with Acre was part of Bolivia and people coming from, from the north, from, from the rivers going upstream in Brazil, took up this part of Bolivia because there was a lot of rubber trees. It was a very rich producing area of rubber um, in this part of the Amazon. But what's the problem there? You know, and, and part of this production of rubber was brought down through the Madeira River. So the, the rubber was taken there and was taken down by the Madeira River. But that, as we have, we have seen before, there was a stretch of, of the Madeira which is really full of rapids. So navigation was very complicated. People will lose, they, they, they'll be like, you know, people will be dying, lose the production. They're like, you know, again, oral tradition talks about a lot, you know, lot, you know a, lot, a lot of the rubber Extract, a, a big part of the rubber extracted that being lost through transportation along the rapids of the Madeira. Because of that then, uh, and as a settlement with the Bolivian government, when Bolivia was annexed, to, uh, annexed you know, taken by Brazil in the beginning of the, of the 20th century, the Brazilian government as, as, as a compensation uh, uh, built a railroad, the Madeira Mamoré Railroad, which was a way to bypass these rapids along the Madeira. This railroad is also known as the, uh, as the railroad of, of, of death because so many people died in the construction of it, of yellow fever and other diseases. This American US photogra photographer called Dan Amaro took wonderful pictures of it. And you can see even during the construction, it was a very complicated project and endeavor. Today, this railroad is abandoned. And what, what we see there is just like, you know, ghosts, Parts of it, like this is a, as an abandoned bridge of the railroad, and it's just like close to a, a contemporary uh, paved road in the area. But while I'm talking, uh, th th this is also the time where Teddy Roosevelt, the former president of the US, 
did an expedition of, in, in, in this area, trying to map unknown rivers there. But what, what's, what's it, why I'm talking about this, the road, the railroad and the rubber in the upper Madeira? Because people like since the 19th century, people are trying to find a way desperately to bring all this rubber from Bolivia, or where Bolivia is today, towards the Atlantic Ocean to navig navigable rivers. As, as, as we've seen before, it was very hard to navigate down the Madeira because of the rapids. And one of the alternatives that people were trying to come across was bringing down the rubber to the Purus River, which is the next larger tributary of the Amazon. I mean, the Purus, contrary to the Madeira, there are no rapids in the Purus. Navigation is much easier. So people are tr trying to find a way to bring rubber from this area here in Bolivia, across land towards the Purus, and then bringing downriver all this rubber towards the Amazon, eventually to the US and Europe. And one of the fellows were trying to, trying to do this was this, the, the, this fellow there called Colonel Antonio Labri. He was a rubber patron. He had like you know, rubber stands across the Amazon here in the Purus River. And he financed out of his own pocket an expedition trying to find an overland trail from the upper Madeira to the upper Purus. So he paid out of his pocket. And part of the trip, and he wrote that, it's actually published in English also as well. He published that in Portuguese and in English as well. And part of the trip was an overland trail that, you know, a track that he took, 200 meter long track with 35 people walking through 20 days, going from the Madre de Dios, which is a tributary of the Madeira, towards the Acre River, which is a tributary of the Purus River. So he, he was going from one basin to the other. And what's interesting about this trip is like he walked 200 kilometers with 35 people in only 20 days. And if you really think that, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're cutting your path to dense jungle, this guy was talking, he was walking really fast because it's really, you know, it's like almost 10 kilometers a day, setting up camps, pre preparing food and everything. He was walking very fast. If you look at his report, it's in Portuguese here. I'm just have, you know, I'm going to use this example here. What's interesting about that, it's published in English as well. He talks about roads all the time. He wasn't walking through like a pristine jungle where there was nobody living there. He was using paths and he, he uses the word roads, which is estradas in Portuguese, along this overland trail. He was, he, you know, had, a local, had local guides and he was walking, he was walking through what can I say, like beaten paths. He wasn't exploring, you know, an, an unmapped and uncharted or uncharted territory. So, I mean, that's why he walked so fast because he was, you know, using trails and roads which were built by the indigenous people who lived there at that time or who, lived, who have lived there previously. That's a small schematic map of the path that he took, like the 200 kilometer track that he took. It's, it's in Portuguese there as well, but just to provide you a general idea of, his, uh, of, of, of this part of history. And what's interesting, I mean, kind of sad as also, that this part, you know, the, the area that where he walked through, it, 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 it includes Bolivia to the south and Brazil to the, uh, to the north. The Bolivian part of this, uh, of, 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 of this territory is still covered by forests, by tropical evergreen forests. But the Brazilian part has been really destroyed the forest in the last 40 years, that's Acre State. And some of you who have seen this, this presentation have been to Acre already. One of the consequences of the deforestation in Acre is that you know, hundreds of archeological sites have been revealed. And if you look at this map here, you can see all these like dark points that you see in this map here correspond to archeological sites in Acre. And these sites are geometric structures. I mean, these areas, they look like savannas today, but these are cattle ranches. I mean, these places were covered by forests until like around 40 years ago. And if you look at their, sh their shape, they're really interesting. They're like, you know, rings, and, and they're probably making these rings in areas covered, covered by forests, you know, squares with, you know, single moats, uh, with double moats, and, you know, it, it, with roads, um, getting all of those sites. Uh, and today we know that this kind of site, I mean, they're, they're better known in Acre, but, you know, there's a big stretch of Southern Amazon where we see this kind of structures as well. So it's not only Acre, I mean, we know the case is better in Acre, but it's, a, you know, it's probably a larger part. What we have here is a sample bias. We, we only have the information about those places here because of contract archaeology, basically. But you know, I bet, I, I think it's safe to assume that areas in between, uh, you know, where, where we don't have evidence of this site so far, we're also going to find the, them as well. And then that brings us to the Acre site where we did our field school a couple of years ago. I mean, uh, the reason why we went there for the first time 
is because one of those roads. If you look at this map here, you're going to see that there's like, again, this area was covered by forest until 40 years ago. You see that we have like uh, transmission uh, towers of, 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 the, of, of, the, of power of transmission power. And one of them is placed very close to a linear structure here. And this linear structure, we know it's a pre-Columbia or an ancient road. But the people who did the assessment work there, the you know, contract archaeology back you know, 10 years ago, say this could not be like a, 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 an indigenous road because it's too linear, it's too straight. This is probably a contemporary road. So they allowed the construction of this tower here. That generated a big debate with the national heritage. It's, and to make a long story short, we were required to go there. We paid actually, hired to go there run a field school in 2014 and try to understand whether this road was a pre-colonial road or a contemporary road. So we went there. This is like, you know, the, the field school in 2014. We did the excavation there. And this is the field school in 2018. Some of you guys may be watching there, may recognize you. I don't know if Ida Bell is there. Mac is here. Morgan is here. Ida Bell is here. Ria is here. I don't, I'm not seeing her, but she's in this picture as well. Tiago, I don't, I don't know if you... Uh, this is Sally here. This is Luisa. She's a Brazilian archaeologist, but she works in Egypt. Uh, that's uh, Lorena here. She's a, she's a, works in our lab here in Sao Paulo. That's like, you know, the watermelon break at the day because it was very hot in there. You can see, you know, Sally and Morgan here, like, you know, enjoying their, like, their watermelon break there as well. So this, this site is called Sol de Campinas. And it's an interesting site because we were able like through the excavations there in 2014 and 2018 to establish a few things. First, we, uh, uh, let me just go back, I'm sorry, to this image here. If you look at the site, there's a road here coming out of the center of the site, but you can see also there's some mounds around the central plaza. So we excavated the mounds and the road and also parts of the central plaza in 2014 and 2018. And again, we, I mean, it's a complicated stratigraphy, which like still like, struggling trying to understand. But I think we have good evidence to say that we have episodes of mound building that you can see in the darker strata, you know, intermesh with episodes, I, I'm sorry, of occupation in the darker strata with episodes of mound building with the lighter strata. So it's like a layer cake in a way. Um, that's a, and I'll just put it together this morning. It's, 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 a, it's a complicated stratigraphy. Things are very subtle, but we have hearts there as well. You can see there's a heart here, another one here. They're like they're making these hearts at the bottom of the mound as if it's preparing the soil with this, you know, with the fire for the construction of those structures. We know that you, you can see it better here. And again, very few stone in this area. You know, we, we, you know, it, it's it's everything. It's soil architecture. But you can see here this feature. There's a heart here. That, you know, it's small charcoal and it, and it changes in the soil color as well. We, we, uh, Laura Fouquin, who's a PhD student uh, of mine here in Sao Paulo, she's been doing together with Jenny uh, 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 Watling, which is a colleague here at uh, the museum where I work. They've been doing the archaeobotany there. And there we'll be finding the same kind of evidence that I mentioned before. Combination of cultivation of trees, including palm trees, but also you know, of root crops. So this kind of you know, agroecological pattern that we see in Rondonia and the sites that I mentioned before, we also see along the acre sites as well. And also what we find, and I, 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 I've seen JSON and, and um, some of those images. We, you know, it, well, actually this was just accepted by Latin American antiquity. I, I think it's gonna come this next issue in December. We're able to find that there was a network of roads connecting those sites. We just have a piece of, the, of this evidence. But I really think, I'm not saying that this was the very roads that Colonel Labri walked through in, on his overland track from the Madre de Dios to Acre, but we think, I think that we're beginning to find, you know, a, a network of roads connecting, providing like, I think network is the best word, providing an overland connections in a large area that I wouldn't know how far the north or south or south it goes, but you know, this big stretch of Southwestern Amazon. That's a paper published this year as well by another group working there. They're also mapping the roads. So I think that's something very promising. We're trying to find a way to, you know, to do either there so we can really like, you know, see how far north and how far, how far, how far west those road networks extend. What we can tell you is that, you know, they're being used as roads until the 19th century. So it, again, it's a very, you know, these are like landscape features that really like, you know, you know in a way visible until the recent past. 
I'm just getting towards the end of my talk now, but that's interesting. Again, that's J Jenny Watlings, my colleague. You know, this was her PhD work. She was doing off-site research, looking for like charcoal and plant micro remains away from the sites, not at the sites. In Acre, she was digging test pits away from the sites and trying to see, like, look for landscape signatures, which were who, who, who could you know match the chronology of site occupation. And what she found out is something very interesting that. The typical vegetation there in Acre, it's a bamboo covered forest. And she was able to see, to show that there was a replacement in, uh, long, during the occupation of the sites with the geoglyphs and the roads were being built. There was a replacement of the bamboo covered forest by palm covered forest. In other words, the people were replacing one kind of forest by another kind of forest, which is exactly the opposite of what we're doing today in the Amazon, which is replacing the you know, forest by pasture. And so it's an interesting, and I, and I think this kind of data, although like, you know, still building up the, 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 the evidence really like adds to, if you look at this map of the hyperdominance of trees, and if you try to look at this data as an evidence of the contribution of the indigenous agency towards creating these landscapes, I think this data here from Acre really adds to that picture. So getting towards the end of my talk. So what's happening in the Amazon today? I mean. In the last 40 years, 20% of the Amazon has been destroyed by deforestation from the 1970s, 80s, you know, and, and to the present. If you look at this, it looks like a map of hell, kind of in a way it, it is. If you look at this map here, that's 2017. And unfortunately, after, after Bolsonaro took over, uh, and that's why we're so, uh, you know, worried about the US election here in Brazil as well, because, you know, Bolsonaro models himself for Trump. After he took over, deforestation has really been really peaking and fires are getting out of control in the Amazon. But if you look at this map here, you, 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 everything that you see in red is areas which were being deforested in the last you know, 40, 50 years. So you know, Eastern Amazon is pretty much gone. And what, what is left in Eastern Amazon are uh, the, the areas of standing forests there that are left in the Amazon. In, in Eastern Amazon are either indigenous lands in dark green or national parks. If you look at Southern Amazon here, the Shingu area, where my friend Michael Heckenberger works. I mean, that's that's an indigenous land here in green. I don't know if you can see that. The, the, everything else has been destroyed by, by you know, soybean farming. That's a transitional forest and cattle ranching. Hondonia and Acre are here. And again, Monte Castello, the, the Shell Mount is here. You can see the indigenous lands. This area here, it's an isolated group, uncontacted indigenous group and everything surrounded these areas is being, it's red, it's being destroyed. So what really holds against deforestation today in the arch, the, what we call this area here is called the arch of deforestation of the Amazon. What's really holding these areas, the, the forest that's standing today still in these areas are indigenous lands. And if we are right, what we're saying here in archeology, span those indigenous lands, they bear a record of human management and landscape creation that goes back maybe to the early to the early Holocene. So that's really I think that's when you know the the past and the present are really brought together by archaeology because I think by doing archaeology we can add this deep historical dimension to these processes of you know landscape creation in the Amazon landscapes which are today being threatened by deforestation as you see in this map in Hondonia. And I'm you know, just getting towards the answering my question. What's the Anthropocene? You know, how old is the Anthropocene? I think the Anthropocene is a process. It's, it, it's really happening there right now. We have isolated groups in Hondonia. These are the Columbiada Indians, which are isolated, semi-isolated, living in areas not far away from, from what I'm working today. In Acre, the Machu Picchu, these pictures were famous. They were like, you know, they came in National Geographic a few years ago. These people like, you know, these are isolated, non-contacted indigenous groups living not far away from places where mechanized, you know, uh, you know industrial agriculture is happening. So we, we really like, you know, look at different, you know, temporalities and time scales, kind of like living side by side. I'm not saying that these guys really are, are living in prehistory, but like, these are totally different ways of living that we see really like, you know, coming in, in kind of a clash in places such as Southwestern Amazon today. So if you go back to this question, I mean, we have different, this is an interesting article published a few years ago by Lewis and Maslin. These are two like uh, climate scientists that are, they're trying to come up with different, you know, perspectives of, you know, propositions for the onset of the Anthropocene. So if an A here at the at left, we have like the more traditional approach that see the Holocene coming after the, the Pleistocene. Uh, option B, 
is having like you know a, a, a Holocene starting around uh, eleven thousand uh, seven hundred years ago, and sometime during this it could be the Industrial Revolution. It could be the last you know fifty years with the atomic test. It could be the beginning of agriculture going back to to you know you know. Uh, Almost ten thousand years in, in the in the Near East, or the first evidence of uh, of one mentality there as well. So nobody knows exactly. That's why we have a question mark in here. And the other options, like you know, true, is to say that the Anthropocene is just the, the whole Holocene. Some archaeologists like this idea. The, the whole the Holocene has so much evidence of people like changing, creating, you know, a, 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 a landscape, but also like already like you know interfering in earth patterns that some people favor the idea that the Anthropocene is something that has been going on for thousands of years. I think that the Anthropocene is not only a natural uh, proposition, but it's a political proposition. When we talk about the Anthropocene, we're really talking about a political phenomenon that has an implication on the geological record. So I particularly favor the idea that the Anthropocene is something very recent, it started in the last decades or a few hundred years. These are different uh, perspectives on how, uh, when the Anthropocene began. But I think, and that's my last slide. I cannot read what I wrote because I, I see you. Let me see if I can change this. Uh, just give me one second. But I think, uh, although let, the process of landscape creation is very ancient in Southwestern Amazon, the Anthropocene is a process happening now through the conflict. Just give me one second, because between uh, very ancient knowledges and, pl and place-making practices, and the violence of contemporary occupation patterns. And again, just to finish, and that's why I think archaeology is so important and so interesting in there, because by doing it and trying to work together with traditional societies and indigenous people, we can bring, you know, we can really bring a deep historical perspective on these practices that generated this forest which are being destroyed today. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. I think I blew it up a little bit the time, but thank you.